welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. The text for this week, the 16th Sunday after Pentecost, September 25th, 2022. Our first reading is Amos chapter 6, 1a, and in verses 4 through 7. Our alternative first reading is Jeremiah 32, verses 1 through 3a, and then verses 6 through 15. The psalm is 146. Our second reading is 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 through 19. And the gospel is Luke 16, 1931. I'm sorry, not the year, but <laughs> 19, chapter 19, uh, of chapter 16, verses 19 through 31. Yes. Right. Okay, you guys were supposed to laugh at that. <laughs> no, 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 I, I chuckled, maybe inwardly, but I did chuckle. <laughs> I tried, I tried. <laughs> See, this, the, like, last week's parable was more fun because it's confusing and you don't really know your place in it. This one hurts a little more. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. it's too obvious. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Well, and here's where we, we, We've skipped a couple of verses, not that I want to say add them, you don't necessarily have to add them, but verses 14 through 18, uh, particularly verses uh, 14 and 15, the way in which this particular story of the rich man and Lazarus are unpacking that a little bit, shall we say, and the for you are those who justify yourselves in the sight of others, but God knows your hearts. Uh, and, and so the way in which the response to, to Jesus words with regards to one's choices, we were talking about last week. Uh, what does that, what does that mean? And instead of Jesus going on to the, you know, another lesson in the kingdom of God, he kind of, <laughs> Keeps on, keeps on, keeps on keeping on with that theme and uh, the way in which uh, the way in which the reality of neglecting the poor for the sake of, you know, one's own uh, one's own justification or one's own choices or whatever is what gets then played out in this story. So and helpful if the preacher remembers that a couple other verses that. Yeah. <laughs> I think when you, um, I think anybody who interprets this passage or preaches on this passage, I think you have to sit for a little bit with the question of what has the rich man done wrong? I mean, the, the reversals are so obvious and so stark. I don't think this is a parable describing the afterlife in certain detail, but you know, there's, you go there if you want, but, I, but clearly the rich man has done something wrong and is in torment as a result. But I think you want to zero in on what is it that he's done wrong? Is it is it the sheer fact that he's rich? Is it the sheer fact of his his opulence and that he his his response to his wealth is just more and more luxury? Is it the ignorance or the the, the what must be a willful um, ignoring of somebody who lives right at his gate? Hmm. I mean, you just have to kind of play with these things so that it doesn't become a simple morality tale of Mm -hmm. somebody who's extraordinarily rich versus somebody who's extraordinarily poor. And, and, and at the same time, I think an, a preacher or an interpreter has to ask the question, what is the poor man? What has Lazarus done that's virtuous? To me, that one's easier to answer. It appears that he's done nothing except be poor and suffer. And yet God mm -hmm. uh, welcomes him or, and, and reaches out to him or embraces him which of course is fully in line with what we see elsewhere in a lot of biblical texts of God just having a soft spot in God's heart for the poor. Because that in itself, I think, is also really scandalous to a lot of listeners mm -hmm. who want to make Lazarus into some kind of a saint for some kind of belief or morality that just isn't mentioned in the parable. At the same time, I don't want to like turn poverty into some kind of a weird virtue, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. see. But there is... He really has, as far as we can tell from the parable, he's done nothing to quote unquote deserve reward. Mm 
from a kind of a traditional religious way of understanding reward and punishment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm wrong on that. That's just, those are my thoughts that, that an interpreter needs to play with so that it doesn't just become a simple um, kind of what binary of, of, these, of these extremes. I really appreciate us avoiding what could be that easy, um, you know, this or that, and we decide uh, what what is the good and what is the bad in that. Um, I would point folks to uh, Joe Green's book, um, A Conversion in Luke Acts, um, where he, he talks about, there's a portion where he talks about um, uh, this question of you know, what is the right behavior? From what do we repent uh, to, to what do we convert? How we use those words sometimes interchangeably. And uh, he actually, in the midst of that, gets into this argument that you're raising for us is what are those virtuous acts? What are the things that we uh, in our religious practices deem as right or wrong? Um, uh, I just, I throw that out there as a commentary or, or as a, a book for folks to look at that will allow allow us maybe to get away from that binary that you're challenging us to. And I'm going to put the focus on God again. Surprise, surprise, the character of God here. Um, and that our systems of naming um, who is um, uh, successful in the world, uh, who is marginalized in the world, uh, fitting in this chapter in the verses that we've been reading are the wealthy versus the poor. Um, and, and what if instead we focus on the fact that um, we have a God who sees, a God who invites and includes. And in that, we can pay attention to the conversation here is um, with the wealthy man who we would like to make the scandalous. And yet this is the one God is talking to. Not unlike... Um, uh, not unlike um, uh, the fact that uh, it is Cain that is having the conversation in Genesis, not Abel. Uh, it's, it's the murderer who is having this conversation. But in this text, I do appreciate the fact that um, the uh, rich man is saying, now that I see what the end is going to be, I, I want my community, my family I want them to make choices differently than I did. And so what? To make a testimony so that others won't meet this negative fate. And if rather than think of this in terms of the afterlife, we think of this in terms of how do we live so that those who are living with us on this side of eternity might find the same peace might find the same equity that we are enjoying. Suddenly, this isn't about the afterlife at all. It's about the choices that we make from last week's conversation that will enable all to have uh, equity, uh, uh, um, whether we the society marginalizes them as poor or not. I think talking about the character of God will get us there and it takes away from an afterlife story. And, and gives us the hope that we can be transformed to live differently on earth. Yeah, I think I th I think where I I'm, I'm I think I'm going in a similar kind of direction, Joy, with this. Not so much not so much focused on you know the afterlife, as you said, and the you know what what has and as you were talking about, Matt, what has the what has the rich man done or not done, and what has the poor man Lazarus done or not done? But I think what I find really kind of key in this passage is the way in which the rich man calls on Father Abraham, and of course Lazarus is in the bosom of Abraham, even though our translations, you know, protect us from such, mm -hmm. uh, you know, imagery. Anyway. I, but the Lazarus Lazarus is at the bosom of Abraham and that uh, that you know Abraham replies in verse 29 they have Moses and the prophets they should listen to them and then if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets neither they would convince even if someone rises from the dead okay so in other words the rich man calls on Abraham 
and calls him Father Abraham. And you have the words of Abraham talking about Moses and the prophets. In other words, the what do the prophets say? What does the law, what does the law and the prophets say? You shall love your neighbor as yourself. You shall, it, where is it that you are hospitable? Where is it that you are caring for? In other words, this man, uh, uh, where is it and how is it? Has he not lived out the law? Yeah. And the law is for the sake of, as we know, for the sake of one's relationship with God, but also for the sake of one's relationship with neighbor and for the sake of the community. And so there's a, I think that that, again, it comes to it, that the, not that I want to say there, well, I don't know what I want to say about consequences, but that that that's what's called for here too, is a reminder to uh, a reminder that we follow God, that we choose God, that we follow the law, that we are we are descendants of Abraham, which which then impresses upon us a certain way of being. And this man has not done that. I appreciate that. And thanks for bringing us back to the specifics of the text, which I uh, elaborated on in making the conversation with God. Uh, uh, but I love what you just did, because that that's that I yeah, that's exactly the point that that is what what is the law and the prophets do. And um, the question at the end causes me to ask the question or the statement at the end, uh, they won't be convinced by someone coming back from the dead, caused me to ask the question, why are we shocked that 2000 years later, after the rumors of the resurrection have been pervasive, we still have this problem, this problem of inequity, this problem of needing to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, I think you, you, you give our listeners a wonderful entry into that, Caroline. Thank you. It's the will of God. Oh, wow. But it's the will of God. And it's so clear, yes, <laughs> so clear. And how is it that you can't see that? And so that to what extent the, the like you said, the afterlife is not, not predicted, predicting as it is a way to illustrate the, 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 the stark contrast between the will of God and, and what you choose. Yes. So do we want to move to uh, uh, the uh, Amos text? Uh, the, the header I wrote for myself as I was taking notes on this is the difficulty of preaching a hard truth in a moment when hard truths are needed. Mm. The difficulty of preaching a hard truth in a moment when hard truths are needed. Um, th this uh, is... The, the text that sets forth um, that um, they're going to wind up in exile, that they're going to be in trouble, that um, there's a consequence, to use that word, for the actions um, um, uh, that, that, that have been practiced or, or not practiced. And um, wow, it, it's, it, it's the word that we still need to have here. It's, it's what if we've been preaching, whatever we've been preaching of the text leading up to this week, uh, set us up for our congregations to need to hear. And so Amos, which is a difficult um, prophet, a difficult word, um, is a difficult word that is needed today. Well, and that, that choice not to follow the will of God uh, again, like a good prophet, does it, it, it does is this you're not predicting necessarily what's going to happen, but not following the will of God will mean separation from God, not following God's law. That's why God put God's law there in the first place was to main how do we maintain this relationship because I know this is going to be really hard. And so how do I maintain a relationship with you? Well, there this is, these are ways that you can do that and not following that law, not following the will of God will lead to separation from God, period. That's the way it works. 
<laughs> and uh, and so in terms of the hard truth, that's part of what Amos is saying, exile. So exile is that ultimate separation. Um, and it fits with the parable in the sense that the parable talks about it in terms of an afterlife. And reading the prophet, it's talking about the present life. You know, so, you know, you thought you had these beds of ease. You thought you had the luxury of listening to the music that you wanted to listen to. You thought you could live in, in, in all of this good. And, and yet you haven't kept my law. And so there are consequences. And the consequences are now you cannot have the peace of God outside of the will of God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think a preacher would do well to help people see this as less about kind of command and punishment that, you know, that when you, when you don't follow some of those really clear ordinances that scripture lays out, that God's going to say, well, sorry, now I'm going to send punishment or calamity your way. That part of this is experienced first and foremost, just in the breakdown of community. I mean, this is part of the problem, I think, in Amos with people living this these lives of opulence, but are not grieved over the ruin of Joseph. Like this is a time, uh, Amos appears to be written during a time when people are are, are uh, observing religious uh, ceremony, when the, the nation appears to many to be thriving, at least from the perspective of, of, of the wealthy. And part of the critique here is this radical wealth inequality doesn't just make God angry because it's unfair, but rather first and foremost, people experience it as a breakdown in their own, the stability of their own society, mm -hmm. which is gonna be then bad news for everybody. I mean, so to help people get a sense for, so this is not just about rewards or punishments to be endured or experienced somewhere down the road, like in the, like the parable might suggest, right? That the rich man in the parable mm -hmm. is just fine until the moment he dies, but, mm -hmm. In Amos, it's no, the calamity's coming now. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you for that, Matt. Speaking of calamity. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and, and this is where uh, you're, you're moving to Jeremiah, right? Uh, only if you're ready. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, if, if, if we, speaking of, of calamity, um, there's a sense also in this that can be read in a future note. Um, so, the future note of reading Amos is everything seems to be fine and dandy now, but the consequences of not walking in God's way is that it will not be fine and dandy. If you pay attention, it's already not fine and dandy for everybody. Well, uh, in the Jeremiah text, what we want is, okay, now you're in the midst of calamity. There seems to be no hope. And what is it? This is a true promissory note because it's like, I want you to go. I want you to buy this land. I want you to look for a future that it looks like you cannot be living in right now. And um, you're going to steal that purchase. You're going to open that deed. And, and then that is when you're going to have uh, um, the longevity of the promise. But that promise is made in the midst of calamity, just as the warning is made in the midst of opulence. And I think sometimes it's important for us to read the text in that way, to recognize that the text, uh, the prophets are able to give us um, a hindsight future look, if that, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which often looks ridiculous. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, Jeremiah is not following his, his personal finance advisors uh, advice here at all, at all. Um, right it's this it's this odd prophetic sign which is also it's so powerful right it's what prophets do is they don't just complain they don't just whine and cry they don't just go and yell at the king uh they also perform these acts like these that are full of hope mm -hmm. and yeah. full of a kind of confidence and in some ways maybe even full of a kind of foolish joy or a foolish kind of Oh, I don't know, whatever. You know, it's a, it's a demonstration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, buy a field during a siege. Um, <laughs> uh, plant a tree, you know, whatever. Luther said something about that, but I don't remember how the quote goes. But 
something about planting a tree, but there is that's that's kind of that same thing, right? Here Jeremiah is getting a field and the you know, yeah. <laughs> It's hardly like, you know, putting flowers in the barrels of guns during a protest or something like that, or baking a cake for your enemy or something. You know, it has this kind of mm -hmm. upside down thing that everybody else will scoff at, mm -hmm. but says, you know, he's got skin in the game mm -hmm. here. He's, yeah. 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 This moment, whether this moment is good or bad, is not forever. Uh -huh. And if we remember um, the themes that we talked about in the past week um, or in the, in the weeks past, mm -hmm. um, um, who have you chosen? Who have you chosen as your community, your neighbor, your friend? Who has you chosen as your master? Mm -hmm. uh, who have you chosen to serve? Um, because um, whatever the circumstance of this moment is, good or bad, is not um, it, it's not forever. And what is forever is the consequence of who you've cho chosen to, to walk with. Mm -hmm. And I not, uh, I don't know, a preacher might want to imagine something along those lines for their particular community or to invite people to imagine a kind of mm, planting purchasing act that says i'm i'm committed to the i'm committed to the the future and hope even though the present is is uh is less than positive and i don't know necessarily what that would be for them but that might be something sort of a concrete uh concrete way for them to sort of embody this I'm going to stand. I'm going to take a stand here. This is what I'm going to do. That that uh, that is something that gives witness to my hope and gives witness to the promise that I have in God. Even though I'm going, to, you know, I'm going to I'm going to buy that field. I'm going to plant that tree. Whatever that is, what is your thing that you'll do, or what is that one thing that your congregation will do that says there's a future beyond this immediate present. But God, as you were talking about joy, that God is in our present and that God brings God's future into our present as part of what, you know, realized eschatology, so to speak. But, um, but actually not even eschatology because it's no, God has a future before eschatology. <laughs> so God, God is bringing God. How do we give witness to the fact that God's future is already here? Mm -hmm. And uh, and that's part of what it means to choose God and to follow God's law is to make that future even more present. And so that I think that might be meaningful for congregations or individual people to, uh, to think about what that might be. Yeah, yeah. If we move to the Psalm, after reading the commentary, I wanted to preach the Psalm. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the reason is that uh, I, I think uh, it's a wonderful, um, uh, she does a wonderful way of putting the psalm in its historical context uh, and using Game of Thrones, which um, I didn't watch. I'm, I'm, wor I'm working on reading through it because I like to read before I watch <laughs> and, and uh, it's a long series. So, um, but um, not to put your trust in, in princes. Uh, and if we go along with the things that we've talked about over the over these last few weeks, um, choosing who you put your trust in, choosing who you align yourself in, and, and reading this psalms with this psalm with that in mind caused me to say, I'd want to invite a sermon that ended with doing what God does. Because the psalm here describes a God who executes justice for the oppressed. We talked about that with the other text, who gives food for the hungry, um, who sets the prisoners free, who opens the eyes of the blind, who lifts those up. These are the things that God does. And if we bear the image of God, if that's what it means to be human, 
then we do what God does. And and Caroline, you set this up in in your previous comments. We do it in the here and now of our context. And that will be different if you're in Canada or in Kentucky. But whatever it is that will be a sign of of hope for the future, that is um, an example of what God does to care for all. Um, This Psalm, um, behind this commentary sets us up to preach it that way. Mm-hmm. It's a great psalm. It's a really timely psalm. Mm-hmm. Uh, good commentary. Uh, yeah, to really explore this, do not put your trust in princes and mortals in whom there is no help. Yeah. Um, a lot of people don't need to be convinced of that. <laughs> but then <laughs> but then, in where do you put your trust, right? What's that going to look like? Not just as an individual, but also as a community of faith that's been commission to do God's work, like you pointed out, Joy. I would use it liturgically, but, you know, that's what I always say. I was waiting for that. (laughs) Caroline, do you want to express your sadness about being at the end of 1 Timothy already? Me? I'm devastated. Okay. (laughs) We skipped a lot. We we missed all the rules about deacons and stuff like that and how to keep the widows quiet and all these things, but, Mm -hmm. you know. Yep. And here we are. Uh, but there actually, okay, so there is a, a there are a couple of lines here that line up with <laughs> with what we've talked about. So there you one could bring in uh, bring in quite a bit, of course, from this last section. Uh, there's obvious pairings, but it's but as for you, shun uh, shun all this, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of eternal life. Uh, so many of, so much of that language is what we've already talked about in in so many different ways. And that might be to bring in to bring it. That's what we're about. You know, we're and to what extent we are fighting the good fight of faith, and we're taking hold of the promise of eternal life here and now. Uh, and then, what does it mean to? Uh, to embody God's law means to pursue, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. And so it, I, I think this, this passage gives you a lot of language for what we've already talked. So way to go, First Timothy. It really does. Uh, and, and as we look at uh, verses 17 uh, and following, um, which talks about the present age are rich verses, Um, And then to put that focus on God who richly provides. And so again, we're drawn to the character of God. We're drawn, it it seems that this pairing at this time matches with the, um, uh, uh, either of the the prophetic uh, readings or or even the the gospel readings, or in this case, even the Psalm. Um, And uh, there's a consistency, which makes me want to say, okay, the lectionary cut which avoids the um, ceremonial rules, which sometimes um, the way that we order our worship makes God sick to God's stomach. Oh, wait a minute, that's Old Testament. Um, but, uh, uh, but what really grabs God's attention is how we treat our, our neighbor, especially those that our society marginalizes. And kudos to Timothy for getting that.